Healthy rivers provide many different functions. They serve as sources of our drinking water, highways for transporting goods, sites for recreation, and habitats for wildlife. Rivers also receive nutrients and other pollution from the human environment, such as discharge from wastewater treatment plants and septic tanks, and runoff from lawns and streets. This pollution can degrade these functions of a healthy river, so it is important to understand the sources of this nutrient pollution and the resilience of the ecosystem to it. The St. Louis River Estuary, located between Duluth, Minnesota and Superior, Wisconsin, is an ecologically and economically important body of freshwater, positioned between natural and urban environments. In order to manage a complex ecosystem such as the St. Louis River Estuary, we must first understand how it works. A team of aquatic scientists from the University of Minnesota, the University of Wisconsin, and the University of St. Thomas are currently studying the estuary to understand how nutrient pollution from human activities affects this ecosystem. This is 81.8. The team has set up 30 different sites throughout the estuary where they are taking samples of water to understand how nutrients from the urban environment are processed by microbes like bacteria and algae before being flushed into Lake Superior. This documentary will follow the aquatic scientists over the course of one day in early June of 2013 and their efforts to understand how pollution from the urban environment of Duluth moves into Lake Superior. It's an early start at the Near Research Center in Superior, Wisconsin. The team of aquatic scientists is sipping their morning coffee and preparing for their day on the estuary. They will be splitting into two teams to collect their water samples. Luke Logan, a master's student studying limnology and marine science, and two undergraduate research assistants will be using the boat to collect water samples on the St. Louis River estuary. Uh, today we're going out on the St. Louis River Estuary. Uh, we're going to collect a lot of water and sediment and analyze it for different molecular compounds. So we're interested in how the estuary changes from the upstream sites down to the Lake Superior um, in terms of how much nitrogen, how much phosphorus, how much carbon, and also what type of carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus there is in the water. Um, the estuary is linking upland processes with Lake Superior, so it's interesting how these different water bodies mix together in the estuary to create a pretty unique mosaic of uh, water sources in the estuary. Helping out on the boat is Ryan Hassemer. He describes why the St. Louis River estuary is such an uncommon environment. We have very high amounts of nitrate in Lake Superior and very high amounts in the river. And Lake Superior undergoes these stake events where basically throughout the day we have high and low tides within Lake Superior that draws uh, high nitrate from our river into Lake Superior and vice versa from the super high nitrate level in Lake Superior into the SLRE here to do denitrification. Denitrification is a natural process that occurs in the absence of oxygen when bacteria converts nitrate into inert nitrogen gas. The boat departs and the second team reviews our itinerary. Chip Small, an assistant professor at the University of St. Thomas, heads team two. Their plan is to drive to five stations on the estuary that are accessible from bridges and piers. Isaac Bergstrom is a recent graduate of the University of St. Thomas and is assisting Chip's team. Isaac describes their procedure. Uh, right now we're taking a water sample from the Nemaji River that flows into the St. Louis estuary and we are going to measure, we're going to take an 018 sample which is an isotope of oxygen and that will allow us to trace or to determine where some of this water is coming from as different water types coming from different sources have different signatures of isotopes, oxygen isotopes. Um, we're also going to take a full sample of water and that we'll use back at the lab. We'll take some filtration samples as well as some other samples and run all of our water chemistry with that water. 
The team drives to the next four stations and repeats the procedure. At each station, they collect four liters of water and measure water quality parameters such as temperature, pH, and dissolved oxygen. Chip's team finishes their sampling at the famous aerial lift bridge in Duluth. So we're uh, standing here where the St. Louis River estuary meets the uh, meets Lake Superior in the Canal Park, and. Um, a lot of people have asked me when, when I talk about this project, you know, is there even such thing as a freshwater estuary? Because most estuaries are where the salty water from the ocean meets a, a river. And um, of course, there's no oceans around here, but it's really the same thing as a, a flooded um, river valley. So it's, um, so it's not really a river, not really a lake, um, but it's this unique environment where, where water's mixing from um, you know, River, river water from the St. Louis River is coming from upstream. Uh, water from Lake Superior here actually sloshes upstream and mixes in. And then there's, um, there's tributaries, there's runoff uh, from urban streams in Duluth and some of the wetland areas on the Wisconsin side. Um, and a major wastewater treatment plant that's right over there. So there's um, water mixing, there's nutrients coming from all these different sources and we're interested in, um, in how, how much of those nutrients are getting uh, processed and used in the estuary and how much of those nutrients um, make it out right through here into Lake Superior. Meanwhile, Luke and his team have finished sampling about half their sites and need to exchange some of their supplies. All right, we are headed to the boat ramp which is near our station six um, for a rendezvous with the crew on the motorboat who's been out um, for about four hours so far and they've filled up some coolers with water samples and we're gonna collect those coolers and uh, drop off a new one for them. Perfect. Luke's team arrives in high spirits, excited for a break. They unload their samples to be brought back to the lab. Tracy Letter from the Lake Superior National Estuarian Research Reserve joined Luke and his team on the boat to assist them in navigation. At ours, Luke has got uh, an FDOM and nitrate sensors deployed at our stations, kind of uh, engineered into that, um, and running up and down the river with the, the river to estuary to lake type gradient, um, where, where some of his samples are being taken too. And several partners within the estuary are looking at nutrients, uh, microbial activity, uh, a, a lot of different parameters, there's a lot of research going on, and all of that gets tied into several of the larger, bigger picture things here, like states and the state's needs for knowing what's going on with water quality. There's Minnesota and Wisconsin here, but this is also an area of concern, so there's some efforts with the larger partnerships in the estuary to figure out what's going on with, with that. With fresh supplies, Tracy and Luke's team head back into the estuary to finish collecting samples from the rest of the sites. So we just picked up a cooler with about 100 pounds of water in it <laughs> that the crew on the boat has uh, collected this morning. So they're through uh, five of their 10 sites that they're doing today. And uh, so they've, they've got another couple hours of work and we're taking these back to the lab uh, where Isaac and Lauren are currently uh, working on uh, filtering the samples we've gotten this morning. So we're making good progress. Chip arrives back at the lab and joins Isaac and Lauren. Basically what we're doing here is um, we like to measure two different things, the stuff that's dissolved in the water and the stuff that's not dissolved in the water. So um, after we collect the water and we bring it back here and we're filtering it. So here we're um, using these filters to collect the particulates, the stuff that's not dissolved in the water. So this water here that we got this morning from Bluff Creek, which goes into Alois Bay, has a lot of sediment in it. So we're going to filter out that sediment and we'll measure the organic content, how much carbon and nitrogen and phosphorus it has in it. And then on the other side, Lauren and Isaac are filtering the water um, to measure, to uh, clean the stuff out and just measure the stuff that's dissolved in the water. So we'll be able to separately measure dissolved nutrients and then the nutrients that are in the the algae and the sediment and all this other stuff that's floating around. A half hour or so passed when a friendly visitor caught their attention and the lab work was temporarily interrupted. But the otter wasn't the only peculiar thing in the area. The lab itself was unusual. 
but it was one where the aquatic scientists felt right at home. So this is one of the uh, more interesting labs that I've ever worked in. And it, has, it has a great view. Um, it was the Boathouse Restaurant until a couple of years ago and the Lake Superior National Estuarine Research Reserve opened here and their main offices right now are in the building next door which um, used to be a souvenir shop and, and, and uh, this building, um, which was a restaurant, is uh, soon going to be renovated and there will be offices and a more um, professional lab, but this has worked really well for our, uh, our purposes and it has uh, Christmas lights on the wall and boats hanging on the ceiling and uh, lots of great decorations, so this, is, this has worked really well for us. Chip, after helping Lauren and Isaac get started on processing the samples, drove to the furthest upstream site on the St. Louis River, one of the team's six end members stations. All right, so we're um, at the upstream most site. This is our station one here in the St. Louis River. We're about two miles uh, downstream of the Fond du Lac Dam where uh, Jay Cook State Park starts. And uh, we're just grabbing the sample off the dock here. The, um, normally we come up here with the boat, but they're running a little behind today and the wind's picking up, so they wanted to uh, head back sooner. So we're just grabbing this sample as well. This, uh, this water is uh, dark brown. It's like tea from all the uh, dissolved humic acids in there. So this is, this is one of our, our uh, end members. The, the main source of water for the rest of the estuary is the St. Louis River right here. The end member stations allow the team to determine the rates microbes are processing the nutrients in the estuary, a major factor when combating pollution. Only 11 months ago, many of these calm creeks and areas surrounding Duluth were struck by disaster. What we saw today was a terrific amount of rain that came washing down the hillsides. That's the city's greatest attribute, this port city of Lake Superior, but it became a detriment last night as all that rain washed away the roadbeds, filled the basements with water, and undermined bridges and... The cost of the flooding was $108.6 million, according to Governor Mark Dayton. The team had collected samples the day before the flood, which provided valuable information about the effects it had on the estuary. The flood moved large amounts of sediment. Some plumes extended 20 to 30 miles into Lake Superior. Samples taken in the spring, the day previous of the flood, and roughly a month after the flood, indicated that normal seasonal nitrate patterns appeared to have been reset back to spring. This is when the estuary is least efficient at removing nutrients from the water. Luke and his team had to battle whitecaps and high winds in the afternoon, but they eventually did return safely to the near research center. There, they unloaded their samples and joined Chip's team processing them in the lab. Chip and Lauren Roos, a research assistant from the University of St. Thomas, are using some water collected to measure the rates of photosynthesis and respiration by algae. So we are setting up an experiment that's going to measure the rates of uh, respiration and photosynthesis by um, phytoplankton in the water from uh, 10 stations along the estuary here. So I'm filling up these bottles, we're taking an initial sample for dissolved oxygen, and then we're going to put three of them in um, uh, in a cage that'll be exposed to sunlight and then three of them in a dark bag that also have no sunlight and have them incubate for two days and then pull them out to take a final sample for dissolved oxygen so we can calculate um, the rates of uh, primary production that way. Lauren determines which nutrient is limiting the rate of primary production by adding carbon and nitrogen. Chip explains. And we measure the change in chlorophyll over a couple days um, and see what has the biggest response. And that tells you what nutrient is limiting for, um, for algae growth in the estuary. Understanding which nutrients limit algae growth is important in setting regulatory goals and in understanding the consequences of nutrient pollution from the urban environment. Isaac, with the help of Luke's team, finished processing the water samples and helped Chip and Lauren wrap up their side experiment.
They place the bottles containing water from the estuary into wire cages. They then attach them to styrofoam floats to allow them to sit just below the surface of the water. That looks like science. <laughs> Chip secures the rope and ties the knot around a hard day's work. Upon packing up, Lauren and Isaac reflected on their experience thus far and on the opportunities the University of St. Thomas has offered them. So I'm really appreciative of my time at St. Thomas. I've gotten a lot of experience working in labs that I don't know that I would have otherwise. I've gotten the opportunity to make my own projects like the one with the nutrient limitations that I set out here this week. It's really awesome to have the opportunity to collaborate with other universities like the University of Minnesota and Wisconsin and Madison. I've gotten to meet a lot of people doing a lot of interesting things that share a lot of my interests as well. So, so far it's been a great experience. Uh, it's really good. I just graduated and it's been good to get out and do some field work, kind of explore my interests and what I want to do and see where I want to go from here. Um, the great thing about St. Thomas being a small school is that you get a lot of chances to do stuff like that, work in the labs and you work with the professors and you know, I sent a couple of emails and before I knew it I was out here, you know, standing over St. Louis River and looking at Lake Superior, getting paid to do it. So it's been a great experience and uh, hoping that I can continue to, you know, pursue my interests and really narrow down and focus on what I want to do for a career. The St. Louis River Estuary is an excellent example of how water plays an important role in connecting humans with the natural environment. Understanding how human activities are affecting this ecosystem is important for maintaining the ecological functions of this river and of Lake Superior. The team's work to understand the relationship is not done after only one day. Their efforts will continue with at least three more of these surveys planned in 2013. Combined with the data from last year, this project is providing important information about how this unique ecosystem works and how effectively it helps mitigate the effects of nutrient pollution from the urban environment. To follow up on this experiment, visit the NEAR website or the University of St. Thomas Sustain blog.